So, just a few announcements before we get into a few short YouTube clips, um, and then we're going to move right into chapter three. Um, so, uh, for announcements, uh, homework one solutions are available. Right, well, be trying to post those as soon as I can uh, once the homework is turned in. Um, homework two is assigned. This one covers up through fluid status. So, uh, we talked about how to solve. Um, manometer type problems where you have multiple layers of fluid and complex tubing and all that kind of thing. Um, that is uh, covered in homework two. You can see that in homework two. Um, so, uh, and that is available on uh, Canvas as well as Gradescope. Is anyone having trouble with Gradescope? Okay. Um, just let me or the TA know if you're having, uh, if you're having any difficulty um, with that system. Um, I guess as a reminder, A is available for class discussion. This is a suggestion from uh, one of my PAs, who's a senior chemical engineer and Adriana. Um, I said it was very helpful. Um, but I haven't seen it being used that much yet. So, but I got a question uh, already on homework two. The two doesn't need for being an early start. Um, uh, and then I posted that question in my answer to the discussion board. So um, you should all have access to that in the Canvas uh, tab and take a look. Um, that's where I'll be putting um, clarifications on the homework, um, and uh, the TA and I will be addressing any questions you have online. Uh, just another note, lecture recordings, again, are available. Um, I try to make them available as soon as I can. I'm using YouTube this year to upload them. Um, that's mainly so I can just see how many people are doing them, where are they doing, see if anyone's stuck on anything. Uh, and I try to upload them as fast as I can, but occasionally, like on the YouTube Friday, I get a copyright claim against one of my videos and I have to edit those uh, video clips out. So I'll then take a little bit longer. Um, so, uh, but uh, again, look for those on the YouTube. All right, any questions before we get started? Yeah. Uh, I don't see the chapter two slide. In files on campus? Yeah. Um, all right, sorry. Did somebody have a hands page open to verify? Yeah, there. Are they in the right place? They're putting in the right place. Yeah. Um, if you could refresh, maybe uh, they should be in file. Um, so it's uh, under fall twenty twenty two underscore three motion. Okay, I have a few minutes before we get to uh, the slide. Um, all right. So today um, we're going to start with um, just a couple of videos illustrating some uh, concepts from. Uh, fluid statics. Um, the uh, yep. So a couple of concepts from fluid statics. Um, so again, we're going to look at uh, an example of someone uh, constructing a mercury barometer. Um, and we'll look at uh, consequences of Pascal's law. Um, both of these are illustrations of this idea. Of delta P is minus gamma and delta C. Um, and again, it's just wrapping up what we were discussing uh, earlier in the week. So again, this is going to be someone making a mercury barometer. We do the analysis for how this works. What I have here is a glass tube that's about 800 millimeters long. And I've filled it with mercury all over to the top. Now I'm going to finish filling it so that I get filled all the way to the very top. So do not do this. No, no, no. Do not do this. And I'm going to convert it into the by sticking your hand into the container full of mercury, do not do this. Set it here and move there. Kind of hold it. Now, what's keeping this mercury column so high? Right. So we can see that we have, as we discussed in um, in class the other day, right? We have a pool of liquid mercury and this tube that was initially completely full, right, all the way to the brim um, with liquid mercury that's been submerged within the tube. Um, and the uh, fluid has fallen just a little bit uh, from the top close end of that tube, uh, leaving a gap, right? So within that gap, the pressure is equal to the vapor pressure of mercury, which is very, very low, which in that case would be zero. Um, and then now we have atmospheric pressure external to this uh, tube, uh, which is pushing down on the 
uh, surface of that mercury within this container, forcing it up into that tube, right? And that's what's giving rise to this smooth problem right? um, of mercury. So now, um, right, this is what we show, this is the way of measuring atmospheric pressure. So it's just going to show us what the atmospheric pressure of the room is uh, as she's running this experiment. Atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury, pushing this up. Now let's see how tall our column is. 744 millimeters. Now, 744 millimeters of mercury here is being used as a measurement of pressure. You're going to see this on, you're going to see this on your homework uh, two, problem one, just the unit conversions. Um, and actually, as we take a pressure and run into it, it's like each inch of glycerol. Um, but basically, um, yeah, it's sort of an analogy to uh, this kind of measurement in millimeters of mercury. I'm asking you, what is the height of a fluid column that would be supported by the indicator pressure? Okay. Um, and this is commonly used, right? You'll see this, you can see something about atmospheric pressure falling, therefore we expect rain, um, you know, in the coming days or something. Um, you might see measurements in millimeters or inches of mercury to indicate atmospheric pressure. Um, so it's very commonly used to measure atmosphere. It doesn't matter what size the diameter of our tube is, as long as it's relatively small. You can see this one is really small. I have another one that's almost twice the diameter of this one. So you can see that the level is the same in both tubes. All we're going to do is compare this crooked barometer. So what's going to happen now? So she's going to take a, a barometer made out of a crooked piece of glass tubing. Right, instead of a straight piece of glass tubing. So, how high is the fluid going to rise within the crooked piece of glass tubing, given that it rose 744 millimeters in the tree? It should be the same. And it's going to be the same regardless of what path length it takes. Right? So, it's the height above the liquid surface, it's going to be 744 millimeters, not the path length along this crooked tube. Right? Delta P is minus gamma delta Z. Um, there's no dependence on x or y, right? So all those little you know, bends in the tube are not going to affect the final height that the mercury reaches. To the barometer that we already have, you notice it rises to the same level. Right, so we end up at the same level despite the fact that we have all the bends. Yeah. Uh, how long is it that he was in uh, hollow enough? If the tube isn't tall enough, um, so if the uh, if the tube weren't tall enough, um, then we would just have uh, then it would not drop, right? The liquid level would not drop, right? Because we would have um, we would the atmospheric pressure would be essentially forcing, right? So imagine the atmospheric pressure would be forcing the liquid all the way up to the very top of the tube if the tube were not tall enough. Um, and if we didn't have enough mercury, I mean, one one consideration here is if we didn't have enough mercury in the pool, um, you know, to somehow keep this uh, tube filled, we might have some trouble. Yeah. So, do you have to start with the tube filled? Will the mercury fill the tube, or does it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we do have to start with the tube filled, right? Because remember, we're trying to get to the condition where the pressure at the top is zero, right? Or basically the vapor pressure of mercury. Um, and the way we achieve that is by Making sure that there's no air or other gas inside the tube when we start. So now, as the mercury falls down, it leaves behind this vacuum, basically, right? where the pressure is basically zero, where the vapor pressure is zero. Yeah. So if you just put an empty tube with a vacuum in it, you know, pool of mercury it would go up. You have an empty tube with a vacuum in it, you put it into a pool of mercury. Um, yes, that it should draw the mercury into the tube. Um, or, or more accurately, so we think of a vacuum as drawing things in. But more accurately, what's really happening is atmospheric pressure would push the mercury into that vacuum. That's what we think about it. In terms of force balances on fluids, this is how we're assessing it. All right, anything else? Okay, so one more demonstration of um, delta P is minus gamma delta Z. Um, and the independence on the shape of the, um, the fluid column. Uh, I think this is one of the more spectacular demonstrations of this concept that I've, that I've found. Um, I think we're going to see the consequence of it first, and then we'll talk about how it happens. 
today we're going to do an experiment to demonstrate Pascal's law of hydrostatic pressure. So here we've got a 50 liter glass jug of water. I'm going to try to break this using just this amount of water. Big clue here is you see this tube leading up. <laughs> okay, but it's something to do with that tube leading up. Here, believe that this is going, like really believe that this is going to work. <laughs> okay, so the question is having such a small amount of liquid, um, cracking the barrel. Any ideas for how we can break this barrel with a tiny amount of liquid? Yeah. Magic, okay. <laughs> but we don't really build magic in, the, in this class. 90% sure we did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> and basically, you shove a really thin tube and makes it to where the volume goes, instead of being kind of wider, goes to narrower and higher. And so that increased height and increased pressure. So you get as narrow as possible. We have a greater amount of pressure and a greater amount of force at it. Towards the bottom of the glass. That's exactly it. Right. And what's uh, so again, what, what happens here is we have this tube um which is leading to the glass barrel and it's going up 150 feet from <laughs> going up incredibly very high. Um and what you're gonna be doing is actually pouring this tiny, tiny amount of liquid into the super, super long tube um that's very, very hot, right? So it doesn't take very much liquid, but again, um delta P is minus gamma delta C. So depend on X, Y, bigger container, um, or anything else, just on delta Z. And so the pressure down here at the bottom, where this container is, is going to rise and rise and rise as that delta Z gets higher and higher and higher. Right at the top, um, and it's filling up the um, the tube. At the top, three surfaces of the tube, the pressure is what's the pressure at the top of the tube that you're filling up? Atmospheric pressure. Right, so just the weight of the column of air, atmosphere pushing down, right? So about you know, one atmosphere pressure is 50% of PSI. I think mean, it's a principle, so I'm not um, uh, And then the pressure goes uh, up as we move down within the fluid column, within this uh, water column, um, until we reach the bottom of the barrel. So as that column gets higher and higher, the pressure in the barrel gets higher and higher, well, eventually it bursts. Um, I encourage you to watch the whole video. Again, this is going to be posted uh, it's in the slide. It's also going to be in, in uh, pages on Canvas with a, an embedded link. And the whole video is great. Um, but we're just going to watch the filling process. <clears throat> so we have here just a set. We have a pressure gauge on top of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few <laughs> You can see the mock pressure is rising slowly, 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 and this tube is filling, filling, and filling. So, boom. It's going to be a slow mo shot to watch, and then we'll move on. I think I need a slower shot. We're going from statics to dynamics, which is a good transition to uh, chapter three. <laughs> Your homework should not be this complicated. No. As the motion, the static part. <laughs> okay, we're going to cut it there. Um, all right, so uh, that now wraps up our discussion of that. So, I'm just wondering, like, this makes sense, but imagine like in like a refinery or something, they have a giant tank of water. Why don't they just have like a 1,000 foot tall like hole in the air so like a little bit of water? So then it'd give you like an extra thousand feet of head. Did they do that? I mean, you could do that. Presumably that giant tank of water is there for other reasons, right? Because you need that volume for other reasons. Um, an example actually that's given in this video is um, the force on a dam. And that's 
you know, the somewhat the counterintuitive result from this is that the force on the dam um, would be the same, uh, regardless of whether you had a giant reservoir or a huge mass of water behind it, or a really, really narrow reservoir, it's not the same. So, but in a dam, right? We're not building it just so we can conquer nature with this giant structure. We're doing it to actually hold that giant the back of, you know, the giant amount of, of water behind it, right? So presumably there's a need to have all of that water cooling or something. But then, like, why do people even use pumps? And just put like a very thin column of like water above the big tank. Horrible. Seat. So the pressure difference is enough to break this last barrel. But um, you saw how high that uh, tubing had to get. Um, it's somewhat impractically. It, it, it's a lot easier to use a pump to achieve higher pressure than to be uh, moving uh, water in this gravity. Because imagine, right? We have some kind of continuous process. We have to continually regenerate the pressure. We're going to have to move the water against gravity the whole time. You right. have like a fully existing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, water really is like a lake or a river, right? It's very bad. Yeah, it's happening. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're put, put the intro up. Yeah, it's good to come to dam. Exactly. We're going to build a dam. Um, so, pumps uh, doing mechanical work um, ends up being a lot easier than that. All right, other, uh, other questions? Okay. Um, great. So, uh, we'll, as I said, moving on to statics. Uh, sorry, dynamics. Um, <laughs> all right, so now we're in chapter three fluids in motion. Blow your finger up. <laughs> so, as a reminder, first day class, the fluid dynamics, the study of um, uh, fluid response and forces, that response can be. Um, uh, can occur within a static fluid. What is the response of a uh, static fluid to an applied force? How does a static fluid respond to an applied force? There's no shear, right? I heard shear. There's no shear because there's no motion. Shear requires differential motion. Right? Yeah, pressure change is the response of a static fluid to apply force. So if we apply, um, so if we have a, a curved surface, right, with a surface tension, we see an increase in pressure on the inside of the curvature, right? That's a um, response to apply force within the fluid. Um, or if we have gravity, right, acting on a fluid, um, we see an increase in pressure as we go down within that fluid, right? That is, um, even though the fluid is static, that is a response to force within the fluid. Okay, so now, um, however, we're going to move on to dynamics, and we're going to analyze fluids in motion. And we're going to see that another um, type of response that we can see uh, in a fluid to an applied force is motion. And this is what we typically think of when we think of fluid dynamics, right? Uh, or fluid mechanics. Right? Um, we think of uh, you know fluids moving and doing pretty things, right? And we're going to see we're going to see that. Um, but I just cannot forget this pressure component because as we're analyzing velocity fields, we're going to have to keep track of pressure fields as well. And in general, when we have compressible fluids, which is going to be the subject of the last chapter that we, we deal with in this time, um, we're going to be looking at density and temperature variations as well. Okay. Um, so, as a reminder, velocity is a vector field, right? So, it has both magnitude and direction. Saw that again on the first day of class. Um, and we showed that pressure is a scalar field, right, in chapter two. Um, and now, in general, we also have density and temperature as scalar fields as well. So there's no, that means, again, there's no XYZ component of pressure, right? There's just a single value at any point, but it can vary in space and time. Um, so the question is now where do we start? What should I do next? I'm probably not going to stand here and cry. Exactly. Um, what should we do next? And you have to slide up on your notebook next. Mass, momentum, energy, conservation. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to apply conservation laws for mass, momentum, and energy um, in order to uh, in order to understand what's going on. Short little research sidebar. Um, my lab is using similar kinds of approaches to study processes within cells. So this is um, a movie uh, generated by one of my uh, graduate students, um, where he developed a method to track 
the rate and direction of mass transport within cells. So we have a vector field of motion within individual cancer cells. Um, so those are the little arrows wiggling around, kind of like the um, velocity vectors we saw for wind um, on the previous slide. And then we can use this to apply mass conservation, learn things about where mass is generated within cells, momentum conservation, how cells respond to forces, um, or we're looking at energy conservation to see uh, how cells respond or use resources to move and grow. Um, a little plug here, I don't have to remind you as we get closer, um, but I'll give the chemistry department seminar on October 3rd uh, to learn more about this, or come talk to me. Some of you have already about research opportunities. Um, so you know, come, come talk. But the things that we're applying here are fundamental, right? These are fundamental conservation laws, um, and they have applications outside of what you just learn uh, within this. Stuff. Okay, so um, in order to get started, um, we're going to be doing uh, in this chapter, chapter three, we're going to be doing essentially control volume analysis, um, which is basically where we choose a region of space to analyze. We call that our CV or control volume. So you'll see me abbreviate this as CV all over the place. You can slide that I mean resume, I mean the region of space that we're going to analyze. Um, and right, so we call this control volume or CV. And then we're going to budget for whatever it is that we're considering within this CV. We're going to write out a budget for the um, mass. And we're going to say um, within a fluid, mass is conserved, uh, meaning we're not creating or destroying mass. Uh, momentum, where um, just to look ahead, we're going to be applying uh, Newton's law. We're going to say F is equal to MA. Um, and we'll see that this is telling us, this will tell us that the only way that we can change the momentum of a fluid or the way that we change momentum of a fluid is through application of forces, right? So this is an answer to that question, how do fluids respond to apply forces um, by changing momentum? And it's all contained in FD. We'll return to that later. Um, your textbook goes through angular momentum uh, as well, where we're considering torques and rotations on a fluid. Um, we are not going to be considering that in this class. Um, and then we also have um, energy. So we will consider energy uh, conservation as well. Um, so we're not going to be creating or destroying energy, any energy that, but but yet our fluids are not uh, typically going to be uh, closed systems. So we're going to be able to put energy in or take energy out of our fluid system. And we'll look at how we can account for that um, again with the uh, conservation model. And we are going to, uh, so the roadmap for how we're going to do this is we're going to start with something called the Reynolds Transport Theorem. Um, and we're basically going to be deriving a sort of generic form of one of these balance or conservation laws. And then we're going to uh, plug in, um, so we're going to uh, derive a generic uh, form for some extensive quantity B, so for balance or conservation of some extensive quantity B. And then we're going to say, well, what happens if B is mass? Momentum or energy. Um, we're not going to deal with concentration this time, but we'll use that as an example. Um, and then uh, from the Reynolds transport theorem, then once we plug in these three um, different variables, we'll have our conservation laws that apply uh, to solve problems. Okay. We're basically doing this so we do the derivation once, uh, we see kind of where it comes from, and then we don't have to do it three times. And here, I want to note that this um, extensive quantity B um, can be written in terms of an intensive quantity beta, right? So the amount of E per unit mass, okay, flashback thermal. Right? Um, so uh, we write beta as DBEM. Most commonly, um, we're going to be considering again some kind of control volume. And we'll say that the amount of B within that control volume. Is the integral over the volume, this CV, I'm using that V to differentiate it from velocity. This is, I don't know, in, law, in my law tech, this is currently V, not my favorite symbol, but that's what it is. Um, so um, the integral of beta times rho dv over the control volume is the amount of P within my control volume. So now, so we have the amount of of stuff. 
We're going to control volume. Yep. Sorry, what was the volume? This is volume, kind of volume. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to use the symbol differentiated from the log. So in the class of the log, can you always do it or just the volume? Um, I can't promise it's all like that. Yeah. <laughs> also, sometimes we use U. Um, yeah. So we do we do use different variables for that. Sorry. Um, which is which is common. But at least on these side, we're trying to keep things straight. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we have a, we have an expression for the amount of D within our control volume. Now we have to ask ourselves in order to write the balance law, how can D change? All right. So let's say that um, B is the concentration of smoke, right? And I have you know some something releasing smoke um, within within the room or within an area. Um, what I'd like you to do is get into uh, groups two or three um, and just discuss for a couple of minutes um, how can B change? What are the ways that B can change? And, and, and a hint here: imagine that your control volume is up here, right? How can B change if your control volume is up here um, or here, right? If your control volume is down here where this um, smoke generator is. How can your the amount of be within that control volume. Okay, so please get into groups, two or three students, and after a couple of minutes, we'll discuss. Got Through it. In this case, that smoke being driven by what? Convection. Convection, right? So he and convection. What? What do you mean by convection? Um, like cyclical motion from heat. In this case, when we're saying we're really putting some advection of the material due to the motion of the fluid, right? So one of the ways that we can have um the amount of uh in this case pink smoke within this uh, region um, change uh, is because of uh, that smoke being pulled into the control volume by fluid motion or out of the control volume. Can you explain what advection is? Yeah, so advection is the motion of this quantity by, uh, or some quantity P um, by the fluid, by motion. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, okay, so who got another answer? So there's another way that we can change things. Yeah, you could potentially generate or consume with chemical reactions. You could generate or consume with chemical reactions, and it's happening down here, right? So sources and sinks are another way that we can change um, B, right? This quantity is going to control Okay, am I missing anything? Okay, that's it. Right, so changes within the control volume um, directly, so sources and sinks. Um, inflows of B 
right? Infection of B into the control volume or outflows of B. Um, and we're going to split this up in general. This is contained all within you know flow that drive smoke to move. Um, but we're going to split this up into inflows and outflows and treat them separately. Uh, generally advised on solid problems um, with what we'll develop today on the EPD as well. Yep. Um, just to make sure I understand the beta, that's just that's a change of B with respect to mass. Yeah, or the amount of B um, per unit mass. Okay. Right. So we're going to talk about um, B being energy, right? Total energy. Mm -hmm. Right. So we can consider total energy within the control volume, within the fluid containing the control volume. Or we can consider the amount of energy per unit mass. We'll write that as big E for the total energy, e, um, or a little e as the amount of energy per unit mass. That's, yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, which brings us to the Reynolds transport theorem. So we're going to now consider some uh, control volume. Uh, we'll start with this control volume being fixed in space. Uh, and now, um, within this control volume, we're going to ask what happens um, to the amount of B that we have within this control volume um, as we have inflows through some control surface. We have a control volume, which has control surfaces. Um, so we got inflows through this inlet control surface, or through inlet control surfaces, and outflows through outlet control surfaces. Right? In this case, I have one inlet, one outlet. And we're going to account for uh, sources at six, inflows and outflows, and ask how does that um, relate to the amount of um, our quantity that is within this control volume. And so we can have um, change within the control volume itself, right? So if beta is changing within the control volume itself, um, the rate of change of that um, will give us our, uh, can cause um, the amount of total B in the control volume chain. Um, we can have outflows of, of beta, right? So um, in general, we can write this then as the um, integral over all of our outflow control surfaces, so you go to the CS out. Um, beta times rho times the component of the velocity, which is flowing that beta out of the control surface. So right in here is the magnitude of E out dot N uh, integrated over the area of that out. Okay. So this is how we're going to account for beta being pulled out by the flow. Similarly, for inflows, we can do the same thing. Where we're now integrating over all of our inlet control surfaces with the um, <clears throat> component of the velocity, which is pulling that, that uh, velocity into, or sorry, pulling data into our control volume. Okay. Get this so far. Can you say one more time about N? Yeah, so N, that's right. I don't know if I ever said it. So N is the uh, surface normal. <clears throat> so um, it is the, uh, so it is a vector, a unit vector that points um, in the direction of the, uh, that point perpendicular to the surface. Okay. Yeah. So the CS is of the control. So CS is the control surface. So yeah. that's any surface where anything that doesn't happen. Or coming in, with, yeah. And in fact, actually, we don't have that in the right. This is called the control surface. So this here, which I have it labeled, is a control surface. It's just a control surface with zero inflow or outflow. Okay. So okay. any like further. Yeah. So a control surface. If you know, it's not here. Control surface is the surface of your control wall. Okay. Yes. So the control surface or the outflow control uh, is the right side wall, or is it the whole wall? So the control surface on this outflow interval is just right to the wall. And that group. We're going to generalize this though. You can see something that looks tempting to generalize. Um, okay, so now we put this all together. Um, and we're going to say that the rate of change of B within our, our fluid um, is the rate of change within 
our control volume um, plus the stuff coming out minus the stuff coming in. Now, I have outflows adding and inflows subtracting in this form of this expression. That's a little bit confusing. It's one of those side conventions that I want to draw your attention to. Um, the, um, so what we're doing here um, is a balance for B, for the, the total amount of B. Um, so what this is telling us is that outflows need to be balanced by sources of B. Right, so this is our source for sink time. And so if we have, for example, a lot of smoke being generated within that control ball. Right, so remember um, at the, the bottom control volume where the smoke generator was, um, we had um, a big source of B, right, in that, in that region. Um, that has to be balanced by something. And one way that we can balance it is by having an output. In fact, that's exactly how it was balanced in that area. Yeah. So uh, the CF on both of those terms is one step out of the CF. Yep. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, this should be CF out of the Um. Yes. Uh, the change with the control volume helps in either be positive or negative. That's right. So the change within the control volume. So this is, um, we have some, so this is relating essentially what's happening within our fixed control volume to what's happening within the fluid that is moving through. Um, and that change within the control volume has in general all the Well, so if we had, for example, it's a, it's a good question. So if we had an addition, let's like say we have additional smoke coming out, right? Um, and we don't have enough outflow to carry away, right? Then what's going to happen here to balance it out? The increase, we're going to have accumulation within our control volume, right? So if we had um, a box that we put, like a literal box, instead of the sort of uh, imaginary um, control line we draw around, you know, where that smoke generator was, we had a box that we put down on top, right? So we're stopping out, right? And there's no inflows on it. Um, then we would have accumulation within um, within that control line. And that accumulation would be positive. And that accumulation would be positive. That's right. But can we say that with like that energy balance where there's like generation? Yeah, so we will then, we're going to say, let's let B equal to E for energy. And then this is an energy balance, right? Um, we're going to let B equal mass. Now this is a mass balance. But yeah, you can think of this as an energy balance as well. Yep. And we will do we'll exactly. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, so uh, simplification um, of this expression uh, is uh, actually, you can actually lump all of the control surface terms together because of the definition of N, which I maybe walked over earlier. Um, so N is actually an outward facing normal. So again, let's apply convention, we say that um, this N is always pointing out, so no matter what the control surface is, um, it's always pointing outwards um, and perpendicular to wherever that surface is. Right? So it's, um, up that way, down in this direction, or outwards on that inlet face. So um, we can see that if I just look at uh, V dot N and I get rid of those absolute values that I have, um, we'll see that V out is in the direction of N. So this will be positive. Um, v in is in the opposite direction of N. And so I'll end up with a negative sign from this. So this is an alternate form um, that we can use to write the same expression, where we're now keeping track of inlet and outlet control surfaces together. Um, we just we start with inlet and outlet separately because honestly, that would be the easiest way to solve the problems, uh, the types of problems that we're going to deal with in this class. Um, and when we're doing control volume analyses in general, um, it's it's often um, useful to um, consider inflows and outflows. A little bit easier to consider inflows and outflows. 
Yeah. So are we looking at only the end of on the right side here? Not on the no, end. Sorry, and all of these little red vectors are n. So n is the um, outward facing unit normal. So for any surface, right, like this table has an, uh, an outward facing normal, which is here. Um, right. And so that is the outward facing normal of this table. And if this had uh, a length of one, it would be a unit normal for the table surface. Okay. So we can define this for any surface. I didn't, didn't plan this, but I looked at it. Oh, yeah. So then in the equation, we need the normal to go in the same direction as the flow of the velocity. So the velocity is in the direction of the flow, but it may be pointing in the opposite direction of the flow. Okay, which in this case is going to give us the negative sign, which we saw from the inflow. Oh, the normal is on the same page as the velocity. The normal is going to be, yeah. So we're going to be considering the normal, yes. So when we're considering um, the V dot N, we need to be considering N on the same phase where the velocity is. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So, like in that equation, it's negative. We have absolute value for normal. So, so to this is the number of positive. positive. Yeah, so the reason I'm doing that is if, um, otherwise, you have the negative. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, this would be um, V in dot N. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, and I think you have to balance with the Okay, cool. Yeah. Yes. Is both? Is that a vector? Or? Yes, it's a vector. Yeah, velocity vector. It's a vector. And we're dotting this a vector, right? It's a normal vector. Right, so here it's pointing up where it's C, but you know, like it's like a table or something, right? You see this pointing in a different direction. So V is velocity in this case. V is velocity in this case. This curly V. Any other questions? Okay, so um, sometimes it's going to be useful for our control volume to move. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes we want to analyze a system that is in motion. Um, we are going to confine ourselves to the case of constant velocity of any potential control volume. Um, but then, uh, in order to do this, we're going to define our inlet outlet, outlet velocity relative to the moving control volume. This is dr, this is v minus dx. Those are vectors. This is a vector um, subtraction of uh, those velocities. Um, and then we're going to use the, um, the normal balance equations with this dr. This is now that dr dot n. What is dr? Dr is the velocity, right? So the velocity across the control surface relative to, I'm sorry, the velocity at the control surface relative to the motion of the control of the control line. Okay. Um, we're going to see this. Most vividly in examples considering a like moving cart or something. And so I have a video of this up on YouTube. Um, we'll be working through one of these problems. Um, and as we get to momentum balances, I'll encourage you to watch this again. Um, but basically, if we have a cart that's moving at some constant velocity v pushed along by a fluid stream, um, it's you have to deal with this dr thing, but it's a lot easier to do that than have. Uh, some control volume where the car is moving through the control volume. Okay, so we're going to sit in this problem, we're going to sit in the control volume moving at a constant velocity with the car. Um, and uh, that makes the analysis easier because you have to keep track of this. Okay. We'll, we'll return to this for sure when we get a moment to moment because we get a little tricky. Okay, so this is the V in there, is this is the actual velocity? Yeah, yeah, sorry. The V in here is the fluid velocity. The Vs is the velocity of the uh, control volume. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because we have an accounting for acceleration. So if the object is accelerating, then thing we have it. Um, and those additional terms are detailed in the text, but we don't need Questions. Um, 
All right, so now um, we can uh, use what we've learned to now develop an expression for mass conservation. Again, instead of having to derive um, an expression just for mass, we can use Reynolds transport theorem and plug in B is equal to M is beta dm dm one. Now we'll just plug that into our expression. Um, so for a um, non deformable control line, so if we have a control line that's constant in size, because we haven't really considered what happens as if the control line is deformed, um, uh, we end up with this expression where I've also said that mass is conserved. There are no uh, sources or uh, sinks of mass. So we're considering mass of a fluid, right? We have that smoke generator, we have source, we have sources of smoke. Um, but when we're considering just a single phase, just a single type of fluid, I said there's no generation construction, so we have zero here. Um, and uh, we say the only way that uh, mass can change is the density within our control volume changes, or if there's inflows or outflows. And we are now going to look at application of different assumptions that we can use to simplify this and make it easier. Um, so we're going to start with a SETI, and we'll look at uniform velocities, and then the time. Does it end in all of those cases? And in all those cases have dimensions. Great question. And does not have dimensions. And is dimensions. Yeah, that's a great question. See a new term in the equation um, that you don't understand or you haven't seen before. Um, what dimensions does that term have in that one? Um, okay. Yes. We work with deformable control volumes as well. Do we what? Sorry. Do we work with deformable? No, we're not going to work with deformable control volumes. So that'd be like, um, but that would be important for them to be have something like a piston, right? Inside of um, inside of an engine. Um, then you might want to consider a deformation control volume. Uh, there are deformable control volumes, but we're we're not. So for this class, will the MDT always be zero? In this class, um, yeah, the, the MDT will always be zero. Where the flowing mass will be conserved in this group. Um, no, we won't uh, have to stop there, but mass will be conserved in that class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to start with steady. What do I mean by steady state? What's that? Um, e is equal to out. Yes. Um, but when we, we're going to get there by applying something else, right? So we're going to get to E is equal to out with steady state, right? Um, which has to, which you can see has to be true. In this but um, Steady state really mathematically means something else. So, yeah, I know it's in the generation. No accumulator generation, it's DDT is equal to zero. Um, so, no accumulation or generation was this being zero. Right? And we're going to see that if there's no accumulation or generation, it's mass to zero. And we're at steady state, then it is equal to count. Okay, so, this is going to be fine. So, um, uh, I guess both are correct in a way, but what I'm looking for is a DDT. That's that, that's what we typically mean by steady state. Okay, there's no change in that. So, steady, so the steady flow, we say DDT is equal to zero. All right, this is rewrote our expression up top. Um, and so mass conservation reduces to the Um, okay. And um, if we consider uh, separate inflow and outflow control surfaces, um, we can then write this more simple way. This is a discrete control surfaces. This is written in terms of you know this continuous integral of the whole surface of the box or whatever control volume. Um, but uh, if we have discrete control surfaces, we can say the sum of our mass uh, outflows is the sum of our mass.
noting that if velocity varies across the inlets and outlets, meaning if velocity is not uniform across those inlets or outlets, uh, which we're going to see later when we're talking about pipe flow, we're going to have a velocity um, variation, for example, across the pipe. So this is it's real, this happens. Um, and if that's the case, we can find uh, the mass flow rate across the control surface and the integral across the control surface of this. Um, okay, and we are now out of time, so we'll pick up from here on Wednesday. Happy Labor Day, everyone. Um, so on Wednesday, we'll pick up with a uh, uniform flow, we can make the assumption of uh, uh, not too long here on the internet. All right, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry.